Well, hello everyone. This is Carrie Beck with How to Home My, Homeschool My Child, and this is Mom's Monday Lunch Bunch. It was, it is so beautiful out here that I decided I would just do this outside and enjoy some of the nice weather before it gets hot and muggy here in Texas. It actually got cold over the weekend. I got to spend some time in Waco. I was speaking at Teach Them Diligently and I packed for warmer clothes and it got cold. And when I was in Nashville, I par I packed for cold clothes and it got warm. So I need to sort of learn how to read the weather a little better, do something. but. That's not what we're here today. Today, I wanna to talk to you because this is the beginning of Holy Week or Passion Week. Yesterday was Palm Sunday. I've shared some ideas about Palm Sunday, some crafts, you can find them on our blog or on one of these Mom's Monday Lunch Bunches. But we've got from here until Sunday for Easter. And I just wanna challenge you about what are you doing this week to really get your kids to focus on Jesus Christ. And I want to talk a little bit about an area that I didn't use as a homeschool mom or raising our kids, but it's something that I'd like to introduce maybe to the grandkids, and that is the Stations of the Cross. Um, I am Protestant, I'm not um, Catholic, but I think there are some things that they are doing that we could really use in our own lives. And so I am going to share this from a Protestant perspective. And so I found eight Stations of the Cross that you could actually talk with your kids about. And my thoughts were this, that let your kids take one of the stations and actually just get some construction paper and draw a visual and put the stations around a room, whether that's your living room or the kitchen or a playroom or one of your kids' bedroom. But it's a place where the kids and you as a family could actually move from one station to the next and really start to see what um, went on the day or when Jesus uh, died. It begins with station one, which is Pilate condemning Jesus to die. Station two is Jesus accepts his cross, but it's too heavy. And so Simon helps carry the cross up the uh, road to Calvary. Station four is Jesus speaking to the women before he gets up there. Station five is Jesus is stripped of all his garments and talk about the humiliation and the shame that he might have felt. And I have verses that I'll share with you. I'm not gonna read them all here to you, but I have some verses for each one of these. Station six is Jesus is nailed to the cross. Station seven, Jesus cares for his mother when he's on the cross and he speaks about uh, taking care of his mother. And then station eight is Jesus dying on the cross. And this is a very somber time. For me, growing up, we didn't have Good Friday service. But with our kids, we took our kids to a Good Friday service. And they probably covered all of this in one service. And yet, this is something that you might want to focus on through the week. There are different ways that we can honor Christ, His sacrifice, and His victory over death over the week. And this might be one of those ways that you could do it. So my thoughts were, one, kids could just take a, a construction paper and visualize it. Maybe write the verse on the bottom. Two, they could do copy work and use some of the verses for copy work. Three, if they're really into video, maybe make a video of each one of these stations and then you could watch it at each one of the stations. Another idea for older kids would be to use a reading journal and write um, each day about each one of these stations. Read the verses and then be able to talk about that as well. Those are some ways that you could actually tie it in with your kids this week. But we don't want to just stop at the cross. We want to move forward because there is hope after that. And that hope is in Jesus Christ. So I want to talk for the rest of the time about hope and joy. You may not feel like hope. Uh, you're hoping is in anything worthwhile. You may not feel like joy is going on. But this is Easter week. And we have something to hope for. We have that Jesus didn't just die. He actually rose again. And our hope is in Jesus Christ. And we need to also be teaching that to our children. So let me share just a few minutes on hope, a few minutes on joy. And then how can we do that even in the midst of overwhelm and just lots of things going on? Mostly I'm just going to read some verses to you and talk about what they mean to me. Romans um, 8, 8, 24 and 25 say, For in this we in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. So we hope in something that's not seen. If we if we could see it, there wouldn't be any reason to hope in it. It says, um, they hope for what they have 
who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not have, we wait for it patiently. And so that is what I would actually say. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. Another word for hope is confidence in the Bible. Philippians 1, 6 says, Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And that's one thing I just hang my hope in, that Jesus is always working. He's always working in me. He's working in Steve. He's working in our kids. Kids, no matter where we are in life, our hope is in Jesus Christ, not in, oh, we just wish something would happen. I talked a lot about that last week. Romans 5, 5 says, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So our hope keeps us from being shamed. If you're having a bad week, you feel really guilty and shamed about some things that are going on in your life. Your hope is in Jesus Christ, not in who you are. And the cross that we just talked about, the cross is enough um, sacrifice that takes away our sins, takes away those chains. And so the cross takes away the chains of our sin, and then our hope can be in Jesus Christ and the work that he's done for us. And then the last verse about hope is Romans 15, 13. I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. So hope, faith, peace, joy, they're all tied together. And they're always in Jesus Christ. He says that he... Uh, that our hope will fill us completely with joy. And that's the other thing I want to say. When our hope is in Jesus Christ, then we can have joy. We can choose joy, whether we feel it or not. But because our hope is in Jesus Christ, we can have joy in Jesus as, as well. And even though we don't see him now, we love him. And even though we do not see him, we believe in him. And we are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. So our hope is in something that we don't see. Our joy is in someone that we don't see. But we know that he has taken our punishment for our sins away on the cross. And because of that, we also see the victory that he has over death. It says, then this is something that, I mean, sometimes joy is one of those words. How do you define it? In Psalm 47, 1, clap your hands, all you nations, shout to God with cries of joy. And I think, is that really what my joy is? Am I shouting to God? And some days, yes, I am shouting wonderful things to him. Isaiah 9, 3 says, You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. And how do they rejoice? They rejoice before you as people rejoice to the harvest. When, we, when people harvest, we don't know much about farm life these days. But at the harvest time, they were joyful. They had food to eat fresh food. And then he says, we also rejoice as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. So warriors would rejoice and the winning uh, emperor, the winning leader would get a, usually a parade in like yesterday's Palm Sunday, triumphant entry. That is what joy is all about. I've also often wondered when it comes to joy and worship. You know, when I go to a concert, I am into that band. I am clapping. I am screaming, yelling, singing, doing whatever. And it's made me really wonder, is that how I am with God? Am I as excited about singing for God as I am with a concert? And it's made me really rethink the way that I think about um, about joy and about um, um, about our worship as well. And it's made me have a new sense that maybe not all joy and rejoicing is very somber. There is a place for that. I think as we look at the cross, that's a somber time. And so we wanna move forward, but we, we honor the sacrifice that we can't even understand of Jesus Christ at the cross. But then we have Easter the next Sunday. And it says, Luke 15, seven, I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents and over 99 righteous persons who do not repent. And that's what Easter is all about. The angels in heaven are rejoicing when we trust in Jesus Christ and his work on the cross and his victory over sin and death. Nehemiah says, for the joy of the Lord is our strength. And I say that to myself so many times. I, talk, I say, joy comes in the morning. Okay, I'm going to focus on God. I'm going to have joy in the morning. But the joy of the Lord, my joy in the Lord is what gives me strength through the day. But how can we really do this? 
Because we, I mean, we live in suffering. We live when people insult us, they reject us. You may be living in depression or you may just be living in complete overwhelm and you're like, how can I get my kids focused on Easter when I am overwhelmed with life myself? When I feel rejected, when I am living with suffering around me, I think there are a few things. And one of them I just said, Psalm 35, he says, his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts for a lifetime. Weeping may stay for a night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. There are seasons of our life when we are going to have grief and we are going to have suffering. Jesus even says this in John 16. Um, I'm actually reading John 1 chapter every day because starting on April 1st to the 21st covers all of John 21. So I read John 15. Tomorrow's John 16. And this verse that I want to read to you is John 16, 22. So with you now. Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice. They were upset that Jesus was going to leave them. He says, no one will take away your joy. And we need to trust in that. No one's going to take away our joy when our joy is in Jesus Christ. How do we do that? How do we still get joy? I have um, three things that I really focus on. The first one is Colossians 3, 1 and 2. Since we have been raised with Christ set our hearts on things above where christ is seated at the right hand of god set our minds on things above not on earthly things and that's what we need to do we set our minds on things above we keep our eyes like hebrews 12 2 says fixing our eyes on jesus the author and perfecter of our faith he began our faith he's going to grow our faith while we're here and then he will complete it in heaven and not only that we keep our eyes on jesus and it says, for the joy set before him, before Jesus, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. And he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So he kept his eyes focused on the future. And that's what we need. We need our eyes focused on eternity. We don't, we t teach our kids about the cross and the somberness of it, but we look at the future past that. We look at Easter and the victory and the winning that Jesus did over that of sin and death. So our eyes, I pray this every morning, fixing our eyes for me, but I also pray it for Steve and the kids. I pray for our entire family that we fix our eyes on Jesus. We keep our minds focused on above. Romans 12, 2 says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person. How? By changing the way you think. Or the NIV says, do not conform yourselves to the patterns of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's right here. We put a helmet of salvation on. We focus our mind on what God wants us to. We keep our eyes focused from the morning to the evening on what he has to say. Ephesians 4.23 is how I do this. It says, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and your attitudes. Put on your new nature created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. I go to God every morning and say, please, your Holy Spirit, transform my thoughts, my attitudes, my feelings, my minds, all of those, so that they are transformed. I can't do it in and of myself. I can read my Bible. I can have verses around me. I can focus my mind all day long on what God is. But I have to trust um, the Holy Spirit. And I ask him every day, please renew my mind. I believe that when I start every day saying those verses, it gives me the beginning of the day and it gets me started in the right foot. And when I focus on Jesus Christ, my hope is in Jesus. And then my joy is in Jesus as well. It's nice to be able to say these things, but it's real hard to do in real life, especially when you have kids running around. I think one thing is even just before you get in bed, claim those verses, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfect of our faith. Set our minds above. Holy Spirit, renew my attitude, renew my thoughts, renew my feelings. I hope that gives you a little bit of encouragement. I will list the eight stages of the cross that I would use personally um, from a Protestant belief. I will include some verses or I may just include a PDF that you can get because that might be easier than Facebook. And then I will also include a PDF with some of these verses because they've meant a lot to me. I hope you're having a great week. I hope that you can focus on Jesus Christ this week during Holy Week and Passion Week. I'm Carrie Beck with How to Homeschool My Child and this is Mom's Monday Lunch Bunch. Have a great week.